Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. A typical student attends an abnormal psychology course with some preconceived ideas about psychological issues. They receive these images from movies, telev television shows, literature, TV news, and other channels. Our expert panelists, Dr. Drew Curtis and Dr. Leslie Kelly, present teaching ideas to challenge students to reconsider the ideas they've, they have concerning myths of crazy and how those ideas developed. The panelists would like this presentation to be very interactive. They'll begin by doing an immersive exercise and would like your feedback and input. If you're willing to answer their question and be heard via audio, please raise your hand uh, using the um, Zoom function and I'll unmute you. Um, you can then answer the question um, via audio with the uh, group. Uh, for the rest of the presentation, please utilize the question and answer and chat portals in the Zoom platform to have conversations amongst yourselves and the panelists. The panelists will answer any of your questions at the conclusion of today's presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a copy in the coming days. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to my friends, Dr. Drew Curtis and Dr. Leslie Kelly. Hello, hello, hello. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am Drew Curtis. And I'm Dr. Leslie Kelly. And we are very excited to present uh, pedagogical approach to teaching psychopathology, something we're both very passionate about and, uh, and hopefully you are as well in your teaching. And so with that, we'd like to start off with an activity we typically do early on in our classes. And that activity involves this question, what is crazy? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about what is the craziest thing you have ever seen heard or experienced? And if you're willing to share, once again, as Brian mentioned, go ahead and raise your hand. We'd like this to be interactive. Uh, the craziest thing you have ever seen, heard, or experienced. And so if you want to contribute, we'll wait for you. And so this activity is one that we typically do early in the semester to get students thinking about what is crazy. So we'd love to hear from you uh, and see what something that you think is crazy, something you've seen or something you've heard. I've used this in uh, uh, intro to psychology classes as well. So uh, this exercise, usually it's, uh, it's really exciting. It gets students engaged and it really gets them to start contemplating, you know, what, what is this, this idea of crazy and what is abnormality really all about? All right, so we... <laughs> Someone, someone just replied they, they'd like to uh, bring up politics, but they don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that might not come in at some point. It's certainly salient, I imagine, on, on lots of people's minds today. And please use the chat function for this. It, it may be difficult to raise your hand. So if you just want to reply with the chat, um, I'll, I'll allow you to talk at that time. Oh, someone mentioned the derecho that hit uh, Cedar Rapids in the Iowa area. Okay, and so with that, what what about that is crazy? What would make that crazy? So the derecho that hit Cedar Rapids, what what would make that crazy, or what makes that the craziest thing that you? you can think about or that you've thought about or experienced. Okay, so unable to wrap your mind around uh, the significant damage. So, so this idea of crazy is something that's hard for you to think about, hard for you to really fathom or wrap around your mind completely or to completely understand. Uh, yeah, I think that's great. Thanks for, for contributing. Uh, and certainly if you wanna offer more to that, let's see a person who acted like and believe she was the blessed Virgin Mary. To go back to um, the derecho, I was I was also thinking it, it's also you know how how big the damage is. So mm -hmm. it's uh, that uh, just the massiveness of things also oftentimes gets kind of wrapped into this idea of crazy. Yeah, and or maybe the frequency. How often does something like that happen? Mm -hmm. 
where that is. So part of you not wrapping your mind around something that, that maybe is a big event and maybe doesn't happen very frequently. Uh, so we had, this is awesome. All of you are participating. Yeah, that's, that's so fantastic. Uh, looks, let's look at this one. The next one is a person who acted like and believed uh, she was the Blessed Virgin Mary. What uh, that comes from uh, Susan. Uh, so what makes that crazy? I think Susan's going to join us on audio. Susan, I've asked you to unmute if you'd be oh. willing to expand okay. on that. Okay. Uh, am I unmuted? I yep, that you're loud and clear. Thank you. Okay. Um, it was my first year after uh, getting my PhD, and it was in the middle of a therapy group, and I knew the facts of the Blessed Virgin Mary being Catholic, and I knew that this was not the time in the 1990s. So it was someone who had a psychotic break in the middle of a group I was doing. So, so what what happened here is that you, the accuracy. It really seemed like like I have enough information to know this isn't accurate. This is correct description <laughs> of your reality as a, as a client. So, good, right? And is that something that you frequently hear in your day to day life? Um, not uh, recently, no. <laughs> okay, so probably once again a rare occurrence. And, and so what else made that crazy? So something you, you thought was a psychotic feature, something you don't hear very often. Any, any other things that made it crazy for you or you thought that that's just crazy? That it was uh, different from the experience of most people around me. Okay, yeah, so once again, not a frequently expressed thing and very different from what most people express. Thank you so much. Social Did deviant. You, yeah. yeah. Did you want to add any other aspects of that? You mentioned as a, as a psychotic feature, were there any other behaviors related to that? Um, that was a long time ago now, so I don't remember <laughs> all the details. <laughs> sure. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, and some others are on. Um, uh, David had uh, an experience he'd like to share as well. Yeah, um, sure. So this is uh, also in a uh, treatment facility, somebody wearing um, iceberg lettuce as shoes. Um, it just struck me as so uh, hard to wrap my head around. Um, it was in, also in a psychotic break and the person, as I, I, it's been a while now, but it, I remember it being something about radioactive waves or gamma rays or something that was protecting the person. And so it just struck me as so um, hard to fathom and understand. Um, it was very serious. It was not like a, you know, there was no silliness to it or playfulness or creativity. It was very just like true to the person. Which, so that's the kind of uh, struck me. The seriousness. Um, and the fact that, like you said, there's, there's no play to it. You know, I was thinking, what would make that crazy? Is it that it's, you know, iceberg lettuce instead of romaine? But, but you're saying <laughs> that the idea is that someone truly believed uh, that this was a way to live and, and ways for, for them to have shoes. And, and you mentioned another interesting piece that we heard earlier, this idea of not really being able to wrap your mind around the reasoning for that thought process. Yeah. Not really realizing that others might find that off in some way too. There was something to that, like that, it, you know, you could just kind of go throughout life wearing iceberg lettuce as shoes and, and sort of not realize that others are going to be kind of thrown by it as well. So it's like a lack of insight, sort of just assuming that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I think the vague, the vagueness and the ambiguity of that situation where you're like, how, you know, like you said, you can't wrap your mind around it. I think that often makes us kind of, gives us that sense of, oh, this is, this is crazy. This is outside, way outside the norm. Um, and it really, we, we can't fathom quite accurately what's going on there. David, did that uh, did that affect that person at all? It's kind of the same question I asked Susan earlier. Did that, you know, I imagine wearing, certainly if you're where I am here in, in San Angelo, Texas, there's a lot of sticker burrs. So that would, that would complicate <laughs> functioning, um, causing stickers on your feet. Did that impair that individual's functioning? The, um, you mean just where, what do you mean? Like uh, did it impair their functioning in the ability, you mean in wearing those shoes? Yeah. Um, yeah, interestingly, I guess probably not. I mean, not not where we were. I was living at the time. I don't think so, actually. Okay. 
So they didn't necessarily impair their functioning, but except for the impact of other people kind of interacting with them, I think, and kind of in, in very, you know, um, concerned or you know, uh, uh, I don't know, combative, but I guess sort of uh, you know, um, rejecting ways, I guess you'd say. Okay. Socially, yeah. So, there was, there was so, certainly that. Yeah, social functioning. Certainly, other people uh, might have a concern with that. Thanks for sharing, David. Uh, who uh, one more? Um, uh, Amanda. Amanda has a nice experience she'd like to share. Amanda. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So mine actually was a neighbor, and it there's more experiences than what I could even say because it basically was an entire summer that the entire neighborhood was having to deal with some things. Um, but at one point, she painted her entire vehicle with white house paint. And when I mean entire vehicle, I mean the tires, the windows, the entire vehicle. Um, she painted, it's a 10 foot cross on her driveway. And then if you were to go by her house, like if you wanted to leave the neighborhood, as you're driving, she would actually jump on your vehicle. A lot of times um, she was half naked when she was doing this. She had shaved her head partially. Um, and, and there was a lot more things than that. Okay. And so what made it crazy was that she used white paint instead of pink? No, um, definitely against social norms in, in, in a lot of ways, not what you'd expect. Well, people um, are doing that, right? Like we're painting we, their whole car with yeah. Color. You can see out your windows that way if you want to drive. Um, she was dangerous. I mean, jumping on moving vehicles, somebody could really be hurt with that. Yeah, absolutely. Jumping on moving vehicles, you said half naked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so doing things that, once again, I'm, I would assume, is this something you typically see most people doing? No. <laughs> yeah. So not doing, uh, certainly was this potential for danger jumping on vehicles. And most people aren't painting their cars, even the danger of driving around in your car where you can't see uh, and, and executing these behaviors. I, thanks for, for sharing uh, that, Amanda. I appreciate that. All of you, thanks for sharing. Uh, and so I'm going to carry on then, if, if, if you will. And this is an activity. Thank you all for being in, engaged in this. This is an activity that typically on the first day of class, I'll get students thinking about the concept of crazy. And as you can see, lots of us maybe have heard things, we've seen things, we've experienced things uh, that, that we think are crazy. And if you hear some common themes, we're going to unpack those today. Uh, this idea of, of a frequency that you don't see it or hear it very often. Maybe it impairs one's functioning or dangerous. Uh, and maybe even the idea of, uh, of not being able to fathom or understand it. So we're going to look at this idea of crazy. So as we've been teaching psychology and specifically abnormal psychology, we find that students come in with a lot of ideas about crazy. And this activity is, is, is just fun to get students involved, especially on the first day. You set them into groups of three and talk about this. And the whole classroom is just very loud, like a you know elementary lunchroom is, is what it sounds like. And so you can imagine as all of you have, have these stories. So when we think about crazy, uh, what do we think about? Do we maybe think about images such as um, this one, maybe, where a uh, straight jacket, asylum, someone who, you know, maybe this is the image of crazy? Or do we think about crazy this way, something like professors at Toy Story birthday parties, something like that? Uh, how about these things? Are these images of crazy? And so as, as we mentioned that students tend to, to enter psychology classes, specifically abnormal psychology, with, uh, with notions of, of crazy things or experiences that are crazy. And uh, maybe some of these images come to mind. And so what we're going to suggest to you is that we're all fascinated with crazy, this idea of crazy and what it looks like. And, and so in fact, uh, literature suggests that abnormal psychology is the, the most second most sought after course right after general psychology. In fact, I think a lot of students, when they think about taking psychology, they tend to think about uh, clinical counseling, abnormal psychology, the context of what makes someone's mind work. Why would someone uh, paint their cars white and, and why would someone put lettuce on their feet? And like, what would make people do this? And, and what would be behind these things? So we're gonna suggest to you that 
we're fascinated with crazy, but not too close. That most people want to, to get a glimpse into psychopathology. They want to get a glimpse into the mind of, of psychological disorders, but not too close from the screens of, of your iPads, your tablets, your telephones, from movie screens from afar. We want to watch crazy, but not too close. And, and I recall uh, years ago, I was at a psychology conference. And as I went up to the hotel room, I looked out to see the view. And I looked down and I saw this individual down in the, the alleyway. And he was, he was disheveled and his jeans were ripped and his clothes looked fairly dirty. And he was kind of pacing erratically back and forth and seemingly talking to others who weren't there. And what caught my attention wasn't that individual. What caught my attention was everyone else who was walking down the sidewalk. And then once they caught a glimpse up of this individual, they immediately tried to avoid uh, or circumvent their path, avoid this individual. In fact, one gentleman jumped into the street and almost got hit by a car because he was trying to avoid uh, this gentleman. And I think that's because we, we tend to think of of crazy and psychological disorders as people who are going to be violent killers because we see that on, on film and medias and, and we're gonna unpack that as well. And so what we would suggest is that crazy tends to be a catch-all label. And in fact, if I were to ask you to go back and think about the term crazy, I'm gonna ask you, could you do this? And some of you already alluded to this. Could you, instead of saying something was crazy, instead of saying crazy, could you say, I didn't understand? Could you say, I didn't understand? And I think you could. I think when we use the term crazy, what I tend to find in teaching uh, and research is that this catch-all term crazy is simply one of not understanding. So our hope is really to reduce the term crazy to really help restore humanity by helping people understand what psychopathology actually looks like. And so rather than not understanding and then moving on, our hope is that people get a, get a glimpse, not from afar on their TV screen, but get a glimpse into the humanity or people who actually suffer from psychological disorders and understand, lean into what might lead someone to, to have a psychotic uh, disorder and, and maybe say things like they were uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary, or that that might lead them to do erratic behaviors like jumping on cars or painting, uh, painting things. So that's our hope really is to, to take this term crazy and use this activity, help students unpack it more fully. And so instead of saying, we don't understand, really encouraging students and others to, to lean into that and try to understand uh, those things that they can't fathom. And so, as I mentioned, a lot of those things come about through movies. Yeah. So I'm thinking of uh, the neighbor, you know, that is, you know, painting the car white and uh, jumping on top of cars. And one of the things that I assume didn't happen there was that people would go up and approach her. They would generally try to avoid her, right? And so just like the, 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 the man on the side of the road is disheveled, um, oftentimes we'll go across the street and we'll try to avoid maybe jump in front of a car. But what's interesting too is that we don't just do that and then walk forward as if nothing's happening over there. We'll we'll be, you know, turning our head and looking the whole time to what's what what is going on. So we are fascinated. And when we have this situation that's vague and ambiguous and we just we don't understand it. Um, and we use these labels that can be, you know, stigmatizing and can be harmful um, to individuals, we're going to do something to try and fill in that gap, right? We're going to try and fill in uh, the, the vague understanding of the situations with some kind of information. And so um, what we'll, we see happening is that a lot of times people are going to use uh, their own experience. They're going to use what they've seen around them in, in their lived experience. And that includes uh, the movies they've watched and the media that they've been exposed to. So Hollywood for many years has done a great job of actually filling in those gaps. And I say great job in the sense that they've done it, not necessarily in the sense that it's been accurate. I would make clear that uh, we are not opposed to, to film and psychopathology in film at all. It's uh, really about the accuracy and what we're trying to, to 
um, really promote here is to our students, particularly, is really being able to accurately determine when a movie is depicting um, psychopathology accurately and, and when it's not. So we see that uh, a great many films have depicted all kinds of forms of psychopathology. And oftentimes what occurs is that in, and in order to grab people's attention, um, that these the situations are exaggerated. So maybe um, like the lived experiences that we talked about, you know, most people with schizophrenia or who had a psychotic break aren't going to be painting the car white and uh, jumping, you know, on top of other people's car, but a small percentage do. And so we oftentimes will take that experience of the, of the small percentage and apply it elsewhere. Same thing with film. We take what we see in film and then we apply it to all cases. And this is where we have to be careful and we have to help our, our students to see that this could be potentially problematic. Um, films have been shown to be a uh, leading cause of, um, of misleading or mis misinformation and misunderstanding and uh, the, the belief in myths. And some of our research has shown um, a piece of research last year that um, we, we are seeing more and more psychological disorders in movies. And this is likely because it is so attention grabbing. But what, again, what we see oftentimes is this kind of exaggeration. So uh, people are not just portrayed as having the typical you know, schizophrenia or the typical depression, but they're, they're portrayed as deranged or um, as, uh, in asylums and with straight jackets. And um, this, of course, gives a very clear misconception of what these disorders are really like. So for example, the, the show Stonehurst Asylum, here's a clip from that where people with psychological disorders are portrayed that way as violent, um, deranged, and in asylums. My name. I am Dr. Benjamin Salt, rightful superintendent of Stonehurst Asylum. When you have found a thing a man fears most, you will have discovered the key to his madness. Why did you come here? I came here for you. An unfortunate case. Tormented by delusion. Oh. What are you going to do to him? Treat him, of course. You may do the honest, Doctor. And you can't possibly imagine that I would. So that's an example, uh, if, you, if you all have seen that, and we'll come back to that uh, Stonehurst aside. My name. There certainly are other shows. In fact, typically in classes, one of the most common shows that I hear discussed recently is uh, the next clip here where it portrays people with psychological disorders such as dissociative identity disorder as people who are violent and they're killers. They're going to kidnap women, put them in their basement, kill them, and then even kill therapists. And so that's, uh, I think, portrayed here in Split. How old are you? Nine. I've never seen a case like this before. 23 identities live in Kevin's body. Who are you? Help me get out of here, Hedwig. So we have the grim violence killers movies like this portray it that way. Also, media portrays or movies and films media portray uh, psychological disorders in a very comedic fashion. You might see this sometimes with uh, psychological disorders like autism, where it's portrayed to be very funny and, and not taken seriously. Uh, or as, as David mentioned earlier, earlier, people that, you know, we do see the serious aspects of how it you know, impacts someone's life and that it's, it's not taken as a joke. Uh, so therapists typically are portrayed in films uh, in a comedic fashion, and usually they're portrayed to violate ethical boundaries, um, you know, things like such as split where even in that therapist where they're they're interacting in in the homes and, and doing things that she you know most therapists aren't doing or classic films like what about Bob, which i'm about to show you where the therapist uh, is having dinner with his patient at the therapist vacation home like this when you stop that please I 
Don't call me Leo. But you said in your office that I could call you Leo. That was in my office. In my home. I'd like you to call me Dr. Morgan. So even comedic aspects of, uh, of this and then violating boundaries. And in fact, in clinical counseling psychology, there typically is a phrase, how does that make you feel? feel? Uh, we typically think of, uh, of people like us just asking this question over and over again, how does that make you feel? In fact, so much that it's cliche that it's found its way into commercials where it's made fun of. And that's why yellow makes me sad, I think. That's interesting. You know what makes me sad? You do! Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby land where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jack wagon! Tissue? So this is just a sampling of some clips in, in, in Hollywood. And certainly if you're interested, as we mentioned, Wedding and Mimic have a collection, a whole book dedicated to films that portray psychomythology. So, so students, as we mentioned, come into class not as a blank slate, but they come in uh, with ideas. And, and some of the research we did found, surveyed students found that movies tends to be one of the most influential sources of information that students have about psychopathology. So they come into class with, with lots of information from movies. As we mentioned, we're not against film, but where those exaggerated features uh, portray things like violence and killing and and, and features of psychopathology that aren't correct, students come in believing that. And not just students, uh, we're gonna share, uh, we've also held some myths as well before we, we learned about these things. So Dr. Kelly and I developed uh, this myth busting tool as a pedagogical tool to help students look at the various myths that they hold. And so of the myths, myth M being movies, uh, usually what we do is you have this myth busting tool at the onset when you're talking about each chapter on a psychological disorder and invite students to share various movies they've seen that might depict various psychological disorders. So for chapter five, maybe students are talking about autism. And certainly there are films that portray autism like Temple. Uh, there's certainly Sherlock, uh, Good Doctor, various films. And then you ask them questions. How does that movie portray this psychological disorder? Does it tend to make light of it? Does it portray it as violence, uh, drama? How does it portray it? So start with movies. And bringing those, those um, memories to mind, those experiences that they've had in the movies and the ideas they've developed from the movies, bringing those myths forward then allows you to start doing the deconstructing and start um, teasing apart the reality from, from the myth. Um, and the same goes for your experience. I'm, I'm brought back to uh, Amanda's story. And I'm just thinking, imagine a, um, a child or an adolescent that was in that neighborhood and, you know, saw um, this neighbor, um, you know, painting the car white and painting a giant white cross on the, on the um, driveway and jumping on top of cars, like half naked. Half -naked. That, that is, um, you know, that child's experience of schizophrenia, maybe they start connecting those dots and then they hold that to be the norm for schizophrenia rather than an exception to the norm for schizophrenia, so to speak. So often with those experiences, students come into class and they, they say, you know, I have a family member or a friend who has major depressive disorder or panic disorder and their anecdote isn't necessarily something to be discounted, but what tends to happen is, as we mentioned, that becomes generalized, or they think that everyone who has major depressive disorder looks like this one friend I have. Uh, so instead of understanding really the, the criteria of major depressive disorder and the individual differences of each person who has major depressive disorder, they may have some incorrect assumptions based on their friend or someone they know or their experiences. So we want to help have students talk about those differences. What are the differences between movies and experiences? as well as similarities between those things. And then that helps them really set the stage to invite them in. It's an engaging activity. What do they come to class thinking it is or isn't? And then we'll set up uh, how that relates to things they've learned about abnormality with another uh, tool or model, theoretical model that we use called the four Fs, which we'll also present here shortly. 
So based on the four Fs, how do, how do movies, how do your experiences, how do these similarities and differences map onto actual diagnostic criteria and the four Fs? And part of our um, deconstructing of the myths, we will actually look at specific um, movies like we've, we've shown you before. And then we'll, we'll, we'll tease apart some of what's going on here. So with Stonehurst Asylum, it, it was clear from that clip, I think, that um, it promotes this idea of you know, abnormality being crazy, straight jackets, asylums. And so what we wanna do is you know, put that in its, its right context. So are there people that are so dangerous that they have to be kind of taken away from society? Yes, that occurs, but is that typical for most people who have psychological disorders? You know, instead of thinking of it as crazy and lumping it all together into this vague thing that we don't understand, what we want to do is make it real clear that most people with psycho psychological disorders are like us, right? They, they have loves and they have struggles and at times, um, it, it, you know, get them in touch with the humanity of the person first. And then at times those struggles become overwhelming for them. And um, then the behaviors of course become atypical and problematic to a degree that they need help. But rarely does that involve um, psych psychiatric asylums or, you know, being put in a straitjacket. Or even adding to that, does that look like people who have psychological disorders overthrowing the asylum as they, they do in that film. And so within our textbook, we use, we use these, uh, these features, the, the myth busting, in conjunction with movies. And so we have myths in movies and we have these boxes where it, so not only the, the movies that students generate in discussion, but also movies that we've identified in Wedding, Anemic and others, uh, such as this one here, to have students uh, share what are some what are things you've heard about movies such as this? Yeah, so 13 reasons why you might have um, remember this clip if you've seen it. But uh, this was a big deal a few years ago because the National Association of School Psychology came out and actually suggested caution here um, because the the TV show they they were concerned really kind of glamorizes and glorifies and. If you've seen it, then you, you've seen that uh, indeed uh, the, the primary suicide scene is um, very graphic, um, it, but at the same time, um, the concern was that this may present itself as a realistic option for teenagers that see the TV show and then of course, um, maybe they're depressed and they um, you know, don't know how to handle their situation. And so then um, they, they, it, gets portrayed as a realistic solution or option. And so what we try to do then is to, to tease apart the reality from um, of, of teen struggles and teen um, depression from the actual reality of suicide as a potential solution to the problem. And especially the, the glamorization of it or highlighting it. And, and that was debated a lot. Uh, some people felt like the film did that, some people did not but we just bring that conversation into the classroom so that students can get more clarity around depression and um, suicide. And so that the things that they're seeing in the shows aren't uh, just kind of left out detached from what they're learning in the classroom, but they can learn to, to, to bring what they're learning in the classroom to bear on their actual lived experience and the media that they're, they're actually watching. And many students will do this. So you put up a, a PowerPoint slide like this, and, and you just basically ask students, what do you think? And most students have, have seen or heard of these series or they've read the book. Uh, and so th they're happy to share, here's what we think. And it's just a great engaging pedagogical tool to unpack uh, all those features. So as we talked about crazy and in these myth busting toolkits, uh, what we suggest to students is that crazy or quote unquote crazy, crazy is closer than you think. That crazy isn't otherworldly. So what we found in our years of teaching abnormal psychology, students tend to have this idea that crazy is something outside of themselves that they can't put their mind to. And so once again, we said, if you, if you think of it as something you don't understand, uh, maybe lean into that. 
And so we suggest it's closer than you think. And so uh, building from the work of the late Nolan Hoeksema, uh, Dr. Kelly and I put forth uh, a model based on her, her 4D model. We, uh, we looked at that and we came up with the four Fs, which we think a little more accurately maps onto the nosological system of the DSM-5. And so we, we share with students and if any of you have taught abnormal psychology, you might know this caution to tell students, please don't leave the class with more psychological disorders than you came in with. And there's a tendency to do that. And what I encourage students to do is when you find yourself reading symptoms of different disorders and you say, that's me, that's me, that's me, rather than diagnosing yourself, that's a very important thing that connects the humanity that it's not crazy otherworldly, but it's closer than you think. So as you're identifying, that help should help you restore humanity that people have the same behaviors as you. And it's not a behavioral difference that they have behaviors just like you and you're just like other people who have psychological disorders. The difference of abnormality isn't that people aren't people. The difference is the four Fs or this criteria. And so we put forth that difference as a frequency uh, which involves three things. And so this we kind of unpacked from deviance a little more specifically that maps onto the DSM. That frequency involves a behavioral increase or decrease for a certain duration or amount of time. And that affects a relatively small part of the population or a small percentage of the normative distribution curve. And so that behavior that is you know, an increase of behavior for a certain duration, six months, affecting approximately 6% of the population, also is impairing one's functioning, bringing about pain or distress, physical pain or psychological pain, and potentially fatal or causing some uh, concern to themselves. So the, these four Fs are the criteria as people are unpacking crazy, you help them understand that it's the criteria here, not the behavior. And so you can do this through a number of behaviors. Uh, one that I typically use is ask people, show of hands, raise your hand if you wash your hand at least one time a day. And so most of the students raise their hand. Keep your hand up if you wash your hands at least two times a day, three times a day, five times a day, 10 times a day, 20 times a day, 30 times a day. 50, 100. And as you say that the higher number of behaviors, you start seeing hands decrease. And so you can show students easily that most people wash their hand. Hand washing behavior is not abnormal in and of itself, but most people don't engage in an excessive behavior like hand washing, washing their, washing their hands 100 times a day for over six months to where it's impairing their functioning. And so if we think of this being something like OCD, where the obsession is contamination and the compulsion is hand washing. Most people aren't doing that so much or feel so much uh, distress and pain or anxiety about uh, the contamination that they're engaging in this behavior. It's impairing their functioning, where they're late to school, missing work, affecting their social relationships, and it bothers them that they don't like it. And also, if you're washing your hands that much, that maybe you're exposing yourself to, to bacteria or causing other dangerous problems. And so you can do this with a number of behaviors like locking your car door, crying or feeling sad to illustrate the frequency there, mapping onto the difference between depression and just sadness. And there's a number of behaviors where you can show even, even things like passive suicidal ideation to uh, someone where, where suicide is definitely much more of a threat. And so using these four Fs help people restore humanity and say, okay, crazy is not outside of us. It's closer than we think. It's not non-human, but here's the criteria by which we can understand that. Yeah, and so we'll also um, connect this in class with specific disorders. So for example, um, depressive disorder. We see you know, a frequency, as many of you know, at least two weeks, five out of nine symptoms. It's about 7% of the population. And with all of these, um, you, can, you can draw out specific aspects. So part of the symptoms, of course, have to do with um, decreased functioning um, and the feeling of in, increasing uh, pain and sadness. 
um, as well as increased risk of suicide. So all of these things together then map on to the diagnostic criteria of the DSM-5 um, clearly. And so we can bring students from this vague notion of crazy through this uh, framework or theoretical model of the four Fs to um, the, and, and connect it straight into uh, the DSM-5. And so this, this model of the four Fs helps them see clearly how each psychological disorder maps on. So using the criteria, and it also informs research as well. So if you wanted to use this uh, for research, uh, recent publication of pathological lying uses this model and finds uh, maybe there's some evidence for that. And so that brings us to, to looking at some of the research. So uh, Dr. Kelly and I, as we, as we anecdotally collected stories and experiences of students and, and various ideas and myths and misconceptions they had throughout class, we certainly have a passion for research. And so we wanted to research these things as well. And some of our research basically found that students do enter abnormal psychology with numerous myths. And more excitingly, I think, is that myth busting using these pedagogical tools are an effective approach to help students reduce their myths. So using these tools within our textbook, uh, students pre-post had reduced significantly the number of, of myths and misconceptions they held. And so this idea of psychomythology, this is a, a term coined by the late Scott Lilienfeld. Uh, if you know, Scott Lilienfeld published a gen psych book looking at 50 great myths uh, in various mythology. So this is Scott Lilienfeld's term. And so we're looking at psychomythology specifically with applied to psychopathology, carrying on uh, his torch and his legacy in, in, in this area. And so we've conducted several studies on various psychological disorders, looking at specific myths that are held. And we found specific to major depressive disorder that over half of the participants believe that their people with major depressive disorder can't be treated, that that's, that's um, just how they are. And, and looks like an indefinite uh, trajectory. We also found this uh, tends to be commonly popped up within courses anecdotally. And I'm going to share with you, this is something Scott Lilienfeld shared with me. He said, one of the ways he teaches psychomythology and engages students is not just say, here's your myths and here's your, your incorrect beliefs. But he says, he said, I share with students the myths I had and how I corrected them. And I found myself doing that as well. And this is one that I tended to believe. I remember uh, my later years in high school, early years in college, I believed that schizophrenia meant having multiple personalities. And, and maybe some of you as well believe that. And we find that students uh, overwhelmingly tend to, to hold this belief that schizophrenia means the same thing as uh, having dissociative identity disorder. And so when I try to trace that back, I think, you know, I think back to shirts in high school, I remember seeing a, a shirt sold in Spencer's and Hot Topic that said, you know, uh, I used to have schizophrenia, but we're all okay now. And so shirts like that, even movies like What About Bob has a joke that kind of has the same joke. And these movies and shirts perpetuate uh, these myths. Additional research has shown uh, that over half of people believed that individuals with autism had gifted levels of knowledge. Though we didn't tease it apart, the idea here is they've likely been um, exposed to savant syndrome and ideas about savant syndrome, and then they've applied that uh, more widely or generalized it to people with autism. Um, we've also looked at um, suicide, and so here um, we see 78% of people thought that uh, youth young adults had a significantly greater risk of suicide than individuals age 65 and older. This is uh, likewise a myth that I believed uh, when I was younger. I thought, you know, the storm and stress idea of adolescence and so that the, the suicide risk was greater than when in fact uh, the research shows it's not. Um, and then uh, last of all, uh, with bipolar disorder, and this is again a common one that we see in the classroom, 88% um, of people believe that several bipolar shifts um, happen real frequently in a short period of time. So likely what's going on here is that they're con either confusing irritability or um, just other kind of 
uh, problems with uh, specific behaviors, um, with the actual longer mood episodes that we that truly characterize bipolar disorder. And this is another one that I, I can share that I, I used to believe this as well, thinking that bipolar disorder meant a, a quick kind of uh, incredible Hulk, a shift from uh, you know a, a person to a very angry person. And I find that anecdotally as well, students will, will share that same belief rather than understanding the episodic changes between a manic episode occurring within a week and then major depressive disorder uh, at least two weeks. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, we appreciate your time. We thank you. Uh, the, these myths of the lunacy effect here, that's the image here, thinking about a uh, full moon making people crazy and some of Scott Lillianfeld's research on that. And so we appreciate your time and, and hope that some of these pedagogical tools have been useful, will be useful for you in helping really reduce the catch-all of crazy, restore humanity, and help people challenge their own or deconstruct their own thinking about um, crazy and understand psychopathology. And we're happy to, to field any questions if you have. Yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you so much. I have a few already, and, and please keep those coming in on the chat function or the Q&A box. Um, First one right at the top, um, what's your student, student's experience been like using this approach? Yeah, that's a great question. As I shared earlier, you know, some of the research we conducted found that students alleviate, or they remedy their myths, they resolve the myths. Uh, I'd say, personally, students find it very engaging. You know, I think one of the things we have to contend with as we, as we lecture and discuss and teach that students aren't a blank, blank slate, they come in with, with movies. And so we're kind of competing with movies and, and movies tend to be more engaging and, and fun to watch maybe than all of my lectures. Uh, hopefully not, hopefully I engage them. <laughs> but so this is a way to bridge that, bridge in their, their interest in the things they've seen, the, the Netflix shows they're watching. And, and students quickly latch on to this because those are things they're interested in. And so it's a, it's an easy way to engage students and, and have dialogue about um, what they're seeing, what they think, and, and the accuracies of those things. Yeah, I would say their their experience itself is that oh, this is fun. We're you know we're watching movies that I like to watch and that I'm interested in and that are intriguing. Um, but then I guess the sneaky part is that you know we tie the research and and help deconstruct the myths in the movies so that. Um, it's the, their understanding is is really a, is, is research based, but as I said before, it's also applied. They can apply it to um, movies that they see in the future once they have that more solid kind of foundation in the research. Do you find the increasing use of psychopathology in movies to be beneficial? I'll start with that one. Sure. Um, so. That's an interesting question, um, because as we see um, more and more psychopathology in the movies, it, it might be easy to think of it as, um, well, isn't that great because we're bringing more awareness through, uh, you know, more exposure, so to speak. Um, but it, it's tricky because it has to do really more with the accuracy. How accurate is what we're seeing from, you know, within these, the movie and the movies and the media? And, and I would say it's really more about accuracy than it is um, about quantity. Um, more, in some ways, may be better just in the sense of uh, bringing awareness. But um, if with the awareness comes misunderstanding, then it's likely that it's also going to end with, with stigma and kind of a dehumanizing of the person. So that's, that's kind of our concern. I guess it's, it's a, it's a two-sided answer, yes and no. All right. Um, and once again, everybody will be getting a, a handout from the authors with some of these uh, notes in there and the tools. So very excited to share that with you. Um, one other question, what instructor resources have you provided uh, for the publication make it easier to adopt? Well, that's, that's a great question. We've, we've provided several uh, resources, one of those being PowerPoint slides that um, have a lot of the myth busting toolkit, uh, the myth slide you saw earlier, 
the four Fs and in all the aspects that we present it today, as well as those myths and movies. So certain PowerPoints that uh, our uh, Kindle Hunt has cleared permissions that bought for the textbook, we're able to take these actual stills of movies, uh, show them in the PowerPoint slides. So we, we provide all the PowerPoint slides for all the chapters, certainly have uh, quizzes as well and uh, lots of uh, quiz banks and exam questions have uh, Kindle Hunt has an app as well, study guide app for that. And uh, am I missing anything? I don't think so. I think that's, it. that's about it. We're also available. We've had um, people request, you know, make requests for us and we've um, helped with um, just different uh, projects that people have or questions that people have. Uh, to kind of make to tailor the book a little bit more to their own class. That's right. And, and so even with the PowerPoint slides, uh, one of the, as an ancillary, what we do, so back to the uh, beginning, you know, if you were to use this activity, the what is crazy activity, uh, you know, you basically take out the picture of me here and you certainly can put in a picture of yourself or you can remove that whole slide if you wanted, you know, if that makes sense for you. Uh, so we, we have a lot of opportunities uh, for, for these materials to be ready and go to go as is, uh, certain links to YouTube clips and movie films, uh, but certainly able to, to be tailored to your own approach as yeah, well. And vignettes, we, we have vignettes, case vignettes and case studies that uh, allow you to, to look at, um, you know, real situations with students and uh, kind of tease apart a real life, you know, situation as opposed to what they're seeing in the movie. This was outstanding. Thank you so much, both of you. It was a great pleasure. Thanks so much for, for being here. Well, once again, thanks for joining us today. I'll be sending out a recording in the coming days along with that handout. So, uh, and also include the author's um, email addresses. If you do have further questions, they're happy to help out. Thanks again, Drew and Leslie. Have a great day. Thank thanks, you. we'd love to hear from you.